a little bit after 6 30 so uh why don't we get started so thanks everybody for being here um obviously we have another awesome guest today and i think greg probably knows him as well as anyone so um greg i was hoping that you could do the introduction but thank you so much for dr kelly for being here and i'm going to turn the screen over to you so that you can share yours yeah so uh um mike is a phenomenal phenomenal human being um that i've had the absolute pleasure of getting to know over the last decade um he trained at wash u um with uh, dr lanky and stayed on as faculty over the last uh, decade um and doing pretty pretty much the most complicated adult and peds um deformities uh, with a, a really stellar crew there has been an academic powerhouse, but he's different than most academic powerhouses in that um, he's he's uh, he's really innovative in his thinking, um, which is different than a lot of people sometimes on the academic circuit that react. Um, Mike leads the way, so uh, it's it's an honor to hear from him today. He's going to be talking about some concepts that I believe are the next phase of adult deformity. Yeah, um, um, and, uh, yeah so I'm from Indiana originally. Yeah, enjoy this. Actually... Mike, take it away, bud. All right, thank you. So um, I am doing uh, children now, and I think actually a sagittal plane in children is even uh, more difficult than adults because uh, the changes that happen with AIS, and uh, hopefully in a year I'll be able to give a sort of updated talk on what we should be doing for AIS. Because uh, I'm not convinced that what we're doing now is that much better than a Harrington rod. This is a uh, sagittal plane sort of uh, current concepts review, but it's all according to my biases. And uh, for those of you who know me over the sort of last decade, uh, I've become a reasonably good surgeon in the fact that uh, while, while I might not always be right, I am never in doubt. So I, I feel pretty strongly about the things we're going to talk about now. Here are my disclosures. I don't have any industry relationships. Um, so I was going to pimp uh, Micah, but he's not here. Uh, so we can just go over this together. But there's a 73-year-old woman, complains of right anterior thigh pain. She has back pain and a progressive loss of height. Her uh, VAS pain is 7 out of 10. Her interest in surgery is 5 out of 10. That is an interesting um, prom that we collected at, uh, oops, at Wash U. Uh, on a visual analog scale. And I, I think it helped sort of gauge or help guide the conversation with patients where if they had no interest in surgery and their problems were reasonably good, then, then you didn't need to talk about surgery. And the real interesting ones were like the myelopathy patients who had um, no interest in surgery and you have to really give them a discussion and about the natural history of the problem. So she's got a pelvic incidence of 48, which is relatively low, right? Average is about 55. Her upright lumbar lordosis is 16 degrees, and she stands with a pelvic tilt of 28 degrees. In addition to a high pelvic tilt, right, which you can see through her vertical sacrum, she has flexed knees and hips, right? So she has engaged multiple compensatory mechanisms and some in her thoracic spine too, right? That she has some thoracic spine straightening, which is action of the spinal extensors to maintain horizontal gaze. What are, there's two things in the chat, are people? Okay. Um, now you can't measuring mismatch and the change you make in the OR versus upright, uh, versus post-ops is not exactly fair. It's really about the stapine lumbar lordosis, uh, cause that's what you're going to get when you put them, put them on their bellies in the OR and supine. Now her lumbar lordosis is 30, her pelvic incidence is 48. So that gives us a mismatch of 18 where the lumbar, you know, 48 minus 30 is 18. So it's positive 18. And her supine T1 PA is 18. And her supine T4, or what I sometimes use is just sort of TX PA, where I measure it pre-op and then you measure it in the OR. So at WashU, we had 36 inch laterals that we could get in the OR. It was still almost impossible to measure T1 because the humeral heads overlie and it's so hard to see. But if you go up to T3 or T4, you can usually see it. And if you can sort of measure the delta from upright to your intraops, you have some idea of where they're standing. And the T pelvic angles or the global sagittal angles are far better than C7 SVA. C7 SVA is a terrible measure of sagittal plane alignment 
that you can compare amongst groups. It's good for tracking someone over time, but it's a measure that we should all get away from sort of including in our research and regression analyses and things like that, because uh, a normal C7 SBA changes with your pelvic incidence. So I'm gonna move. Here's her MRI, right? We all wanna see the MRI. She's got multiple areas of foraminal and central stenosis, not all that surprising. She's got uh, paraspinals that look like Kobe beef, which is never good and always makes me worry about some sort of proximal failure. We have a CT scan. Now the critical things on the CT scan, right? She's got a fixed coronal malalignment here. So to make her straight, right? If you are one of the people that desires a Cobb angle of zero, you got to cut that. And she has vacuum discs here, which leaves us lots of opportunity for getting correction. We also collect promise. Her pain interference is extremely high and her physical function is very low. So treatment options, what are we gonna do, right? What's our UIV? We're gonna do inner bodies. How are we gonna position her on the bed? Which OR bed? I really like the pro-access table for making lordosis, but more importantly, what are our alignment targets? What's her low lordosis need to be? What's her total lordosis going to be? And what do we do with the thoracic spine? Uh, again, sorry, I don't know any of your names, but I would be asking you guys lots of questions. So this is a pro-axis table. She's bent on this thing. We filled in one of the disc spaces that popped open with bone graft, but not with metal. I generally uh, sort of above four or five uh, really moved away from using man-made implants and uh, tried to reserve four, five, five, one for either very large transfer aminals uh, or anteriors, but not the small bullets or anything like that anymore. More importantly, if you look at her prone uh, AP, right? She's almost centered, but she's got this big curve, but we also know that this is fixed. So what are we gonna do? How are we going to, uh, what is this one? No, I can't ask for Micah. Micah's uh, gonna get yelled at by Chris Shaffrey. I uh, think he's on. <laughs> uh, so, but I can ask Cody? Yeah. All right, Cody, what do you think? Should we go higher? Do we need to go up to our upper thoracic spine? to cover this kyphosis here, even though it was pretty straight pre-op, how much lordosis do you wanna make for someone who's got a pelvic incidence of, let's call it 50 for easy math, and she's 73 years old? Yeah, so pelvic incidence of 50, so 50 times 0.6 plus 30 gives you 60. Yeah, somebody has been doing his homework. 60. So yeah. it's 10 greater, right? Which also lets you understand that if you just put her prone and you say, that's ah, pretty close. Our mismatch is 18, but she's 73 and they can tolerate under correction, which is not true. Um, we'll just put her prone and put their rods in. And believe me, like lots of WashU fellows did that because we saw Keith Bridwell do a version of that was, that was much more refined and experienced than what we were doing. And we made flatbacks, all the graduates. Keith didn't because he knew what was going on, but we had no idea what he was doing. And we were just trying to emulate him and doing a terrible job of it. But if you put her prone and leave her with an 18 degree mismatch, that's actually 28 degrees off of where she should be for normal standing, uh, which is, that's pretty big difference, right? That's not a couple degrees, that's a lot. And what, what do you want to do with the coronal plane? How are we going to, fix the coronal plane and leave her head in the middle and not mess up the sagittal plane. I think if you don't need to correct the coronal plane for like pyramidal reasons, it's reasonable to leave her where she is. Yes, uh, good answer. But if you do uh, sometimes people have a very strong desire to correct the coronal plane. The coronal plane needs balance, right? Sagittal plane needs proper alignment. The coronal plane needs balance. So you can see here, we corrected her. Her femoral heads are now underneath the front of her sacrum. C7 falls through the sacrum. I stopped, I, I, I gave her a lower thoracic UIV in part because she's a low PI patient who had some compensation here pre-op. So if you get them right, I think that they'll just stand and now they can stand in a comfortable position. There's not a residual ventral force there. Uh, and then I'll show you the AP. I put this one in for Kleinberg. He hates when I, when I used to do this, that this was my adaptation of my, my partner, Manish Gupta used posted screws 
uh, and would have re straight rod and incredible lordosis. And then if you look carefully, there was some, he never had this much residual curve, but some residual curve because he could do offset connectors to the posts. And this way you bend this rod into the lordosis you want, you capture it down here and then just flip these things over and capture them all and it stays there. And then this rod, in this case, it's uh, cobalt chrome. Oftentimes this one, I would use a titanium rod just to sort of let it lie, fall in and the titanium will deform to the screw head. Cobalt chrome will rip your screws out, right? The screws go to cobalt chrome, titanium goes to the screw. So what are the takeaways, right? I think persistent compensatory mechanisms are bad. I don't, and if you read that, you know, the thing is, so the ISSG has age adjusted and the ESSG has gap score. Gap score, you get an extra point if you were older because they found that older patients were most intolerant of malalignment. And age adjusted says malalign them intentionally, they can handle it. And I think you guys are gonna sort of need to pause and think about where you fall and your sort of belief processes. But I think that persistent compensatory mechanisms are bad. And this is a, a finite element analysis paper by Wu Jin Cho that uh, Barrow, I've, I've asked Barrow a couple of times, they have a great uh, biomechanics lab. They should do a little, they did one where they showed overcorrection was bad. Um, but this shows that undercorrection, right, is bad because you have a residual ventral force, ventrally directed force uh, above the UIV, which can lead to PJK. Or you can also get tension in the dorsal column. So, you, and you don't fix femurs with tension, right? We want to compress things to get them to heal. So if people stand up and their pelvis is retroverting and they're falling forward, that is leaving your lumbosacral junction under tension, not under compression. And that is why more often um, than in a good alignment situation, you will pseudo. Now pseudo and PJK and PROMS in particular, they're all extremely multifactorial with um, lots of noise. I think anyone who's interested in this kind of stuff, if you read the, the book Noise that just came out or listen to some of the podcasts about it, it may help you understand it a little bit more, but there are things that we will never control as we try to predict these uh, and make good models for them because of noise, not biases, but noise. So we wanna focus on sagittal alignment and coronal balance, and these are totally different. One of the important ways of sort of, I think, thinking about sagittal plane alignment is the Roosley classification. He has, there are now five types, right? And the types describe the shape of the spine. A type one is a long sweeping thoracic kyphosis and the inflection point is around L4, the L4, L5 disc. So that they have very little, they actually have kyphosis from L1 to L3 and all of their lordosis is low. These tend to be the lowest pelvic incidence patients. Your, you know, Frank Schwab will criticize this and say, look, it's a spectrum, it's not five types. That's certainly true. This is just helps you sort of work in a framework uh, to conceptualize what's happening. So as the, the pelvic incidence increases, what happens is the apex of your lordosis moves rostral, the amount of lordosis increases and the magnitude of compensatory or uh, compensatory thoracic kyphosis increases also. And as you can see, so type twos, type threes and type fours are just spectrums of the same picture of this sort of backwards S shape. And what you also see is as pelvic incidence increases, so does pelvic tilt and so does C7 SVA. So that's why I think aiming for, you know, the T1PA paper, uh, if Mundus wants to do a journal club, I'm happy to do that with them. That paper, while it offers, it offered unique data and ideas, um, the paper is no good. And I don't think it would get published in JBJS anymore because 12 is not the number. The number varies with your pelvic incidence. Normal pelvic tilt increases with your pelvic incidence. So just aiming for a PT less than 20 is also not appropriate and we can do better. You know, the best illustration of why this matters in the concept of sagittal alignment versus balance is the Rusli false type two. So a false type two is a person who's supposed to be over here, a type three or type four with more lordosis, more lordosis, more kyphosis, and a good SVA. A false type two is someone who stands like this, with a little lordosis, a little kyphosis, and a retroverted pelvis because they actually belong over here, but you didn't get them there. But that it also illustrates why C7 SVA is a lousy measure, right? This woman's, and this is all my work. This is one of my 
mess ups. And this case was done before I sort of started understanding this a little bit better. C7 SVA is good, but look at where our hips are. And this is the deadly combination of C7 falling between the sacrum and the femoral heads. And she's maximally compensated here. She thinks she's better. And for a year, <clears throat> a year, I think we're real good. But what happens? She retroverts her pelvis, right? This is spinning this way. Now this stuff is all attached because of the metal. So what happens next? This metal is moving this way because the bottom is retroverting, right? Now what happens up top? Oh, what's going on here? She's still forward. So this part's trying to go this way. And now what does she do? This is a year. This is a year and a half. This is a couple months later. Now she's a train wreck because she's flat. She needs more lordosis. And this false type two is not a good situation. So then she finally gets the surgery she needs. Now, what we want, like it's a spectrum, right? And it's not, you, you need frameworks within which to work. What are constants or reasonably reliable constants? So we performed the multi-ethnic alignment normative uh, data study called MEANS, where we got pay, volunteer asymptomatic patients from five continents. So we got lots of different ethnicities, lots of different ages. And what I did was run through that normative data because you can be asymptomatic with spinal deformity. And I don't want that. I want to know normal, normal. So we removed all the people with any degeneration, right? Because any degeneration leads to segmental lordosis loss, which is by definition, some deformity, right? So that another whole talk is like, well, when does it, when does degenerative become deformity? It's, it's irrelevant, right? That's a silly sort of um, dichotomization of what we do. You got to get the alignment right the first time before you set them up for failure. And now sagittal alignment by age. This is one of the first things we looked at because I really want to sort of put the nail in the coffin for the concept of uh, age adjusted alignment parameters. Sagittal alignment by age. Now, and I asked you, what are constants? T1 tilt. Look at T1 tilt. It is R squared 0.01 over age, independent of age. People try to stand and it's, this, it's almost the same, right? Look at this, this a very tight distribution. L1 tilt not quite as tight a distribution, also independent of age, pelvic tilt, sort of all over the place. And I think some of pelvic tilt has to do with the shape of your acetabulum, which we have no good way of measuring yet, but also independent of age, T1 pelvic angle, L1 pelvic angle, lordosis, in the absence of degeneration, you still stand normally. And degeneration tends to happen with age, but we're measuring degeneration. And the people who remote age adjusted are just using age as a proxy for degeneration, which is not fair. So in the absence of deformity or degeneration, sagittal alignment is not associated with age. They're, it's got nothing to do with it. So as we look at these normal people, what are the things we want to take away? And what are the, some of the ideas that I am sort of in favor now versus things that have been promoted? So look at L4 to S1. This is pelvic incidence. Now the x-axis is pelvic incidence. L4 to S1 lordosis is essentially unrelated to pelvic incidence. Also, it is essentially, if you look in general, the scatter plot's pretty tight. This is about 15 to 35, 10 on each side. But on average, it's 25 degrees. And some of you may have heard me say in the past, like averages are no good, right? We need to move towards personalized medicine, but there are situations where you need to make a sacrifice and, and accept average. On average, L5-S1 is 25. On average, L4-L5 is 15. And I think this is important for thinking about how you treat degenerative spondees. I just reviewed, if, sorry if it was one of you guys, reviewed and rejected a spine paper where they said, look, at one year for degen spondees, alignment didn't matter. And all you have to do is decompress nerve roots and don't worry about the sagittal plane. And that is like the most wrong message we can possibly be saying. And that paper, if they followed them long enough, you will find that at, if you make them flat, they'll tend to degenerate at L5-S1 or L3-L4. Then you'll do another flat surgery and then they end up in Mundus's clinic and need a big surgery. So how, and the other thing is, right, this is relatively constant. It is not that two thirds rule that people talk about. So essentially you wanna get 40 degrees down low, L4-S1, 40 degrees. As you go above L4, that is where the distribution of lordosis changes. And that is how the shape 
changes, right? And we can see here, these are the, and it also, it's important to note, right? That the inflection point between kyphosis and lordosis, the fact that we use, we measure L1 to S1 is essentially like um, uh, goodwill hunting, right? It's random. It's just random. We chose L1 because it doesn't have a rib on it. But in people with high lump or high pelvic incidence, their inflection point where they start to switch back into kyphosis isn't up past until they're past the thoracolumbar junction, as opposed to here, right? Low pelvic incidence. These are people that are turning around down low. But what we know, right? We know from Rousselli, right? That there's a shape that people want. And we know from Frank Schwab's work and GAP um, and even the T1PA that there is a magnitude that people want, right? A lordosis magnitude that people want to be able to stand normally. So how are we gonna put all of that together into a usable thing? So now we wanna, if we can define balance by pelvic incidence alone, a really nice measure is the L1 pelvic angle, right? So that is a line from the center of S1 to the middle of the femoral heads, and then from L1 to the center of the femoral heads and the angle subtended there. And if you guys look back and like Cody said, 60% of PI, plus 30, right? If you look back at that, R squared of that is 0.3, which means there's substantial unaccounted for variance in that simple little linear regression model. An R squared of 0.6 for a prediction model is not bad. And these are the 80% prediction intervals. So we're, you're pretty tightly clustered around this line that is 50% of PI minus 20. Uh, and I'll show you guys pictures of that. And the nice thing about the L1 pelvic angle is that also, as you, you may have heard me talking to Greg earlier, is that in the OR, it's very easy to measure. When you have a patient like we just showed, right, where they have residual coronal plane deformity, it's hard to measure those end plates in the OR and know what your L1 to S1 lordosis is with, with good precision. This is the center of S1, the center of L1, and the femoral heads. Much, much easier to measure that and accurately get it. And the good thing is that this describes the magnitude and the shape. So to see it in action, right? C2 tilt, T1 tilt, L1 tilt, are all essentially the same in people that stand normally. And the balance comes from the interaction of the spinal curvatures and pelvic version. So this is a patient with a pelvic incidence of 80, who stands with a T1 tilt of negative four, and L1 tilt of negative eight. This is a patient with a pelvic incidence of 30, who stands with a T1 tilt of negative two, right? They're trying to balance in the same cone of economy and the L1 tilt of negative eight. So identical L1 tilts, totally different lumbopelvic anatomy and thoracic anatomy. And this is what we were saying before. And this goes back to um, what Cody and I talked about earlier, right? That these, this is a five degree mismatch. This is a model of a patient with a pelvic incidence of 40 and a lumbar lordosis of 35. That's only five degrees off. Now, if you give their lordosis up high, right? You see this, this is a flat L4, L5, flat L5, S1. I would say that this is the classic, like third time surgery gets an ACR patient, right? They're flat and then they're flat and then they get an ACR. So you have a lot of lordosis up high, but it leaves them with a high lumbar pelvic angle because their hips are gonna stay here in the way that they can stand upright, right? They wanna get back into this green. The only way they can do that is to massively retrovert their pelvis and extend their thoracic spine. Now, what if you say, okay, well, we're gonna do an A-lift here and you do one A-lift, but then the rest of it's flat. It's still too low of a L1PA. L1PA, the L1 needs to be behind uh, the sacrum for these low pelvic incidence patients. So this person's going to need to retro retrovert their pelvis a bit and then massively extend their thoracic spine. And you'll see, if you guys watch in the clinic, sometimes you'll see patients come in with lordotic thoracic spines. And that is, that's actually, I believe that's good. That means their spinal extensors are working. Uh, and it has changed my play. When I was early in my practice, we'd say, oh, that's deformity. We got to pull that out. And we would do a T3 to the sacrum on these poor people when in fact all they need is some work down low and you can do an L2 to the sacrum, fix it all, and they stand normally. Now, what if you give them what could be called high lumbar lordosis, though this is actually appropriate, right? And there's not many people out there who are gonna say, okay, PI of 40, I'm gonna give you 55. There's a lot of people are gonna say, oh, that's, oh, that's hugely overcorrected. It is, that's 
not true. So now, what if you put it in the wrong place again, right? It's all up high. Their L1PA ends up too high and they are going to retrovert their, their pelvis. And this is the one that like, we all know these, these are the disasters. This is like ACR at two or three levels. And this is essentially, if you look at this, this is upside down spine is what I call it. If you flip this over, it'd be money, but it's not flipped over and that's the problem. So they go back like this, all of a sudden they end up negative and they PJK horribly. Now, if you balance it, you put it all in the right place, you get L1 in the right place in, in two dimensional space. This, that's one area where uh, Dr. Newton and I thus far disagree that I think the sagittal plane is a two dimensional system uh, and he thinks it's three dimensional. Makes for interesting uh, conferences. This patient's going to balance. They're going to stand, and now they can stand upright without doing any work. They don't have any juxtafusional forces. They're not retroverting their pelvis. They can stand up very comfortably uh, and happily. And I think, like for those of us who have sort of adopted and recognized this, this led to some of my happiest patients. What they don't like is sitting down. They hate sitting down. Uh, so you know, we got a couple minutes. I think everyone tends to want to stand with a similar C2 tilt or T1 tilt or L1 tilt. And the fact that we want to stand with a similar T C2 tilt is where all of those compensatory mechanisms come in if you malalign them. And when we fuse people, we need to try our best to be able to put them in a situation where they can stand here without doing work. I strongly believe and agree with GAP score that, that sagittal malalignment promotes uh, mechanical complications like proximal junctional kyphosis and pseudarthrosis. I think despite the fact that the number of people who throw wrenches at GAP and say that, oh, we couldn't externally validate it, that's fine because PJK and pseudarthrosis, as I said before, are so confounded by uncontrollable noise that there's just, there are things that we will never control. And we need to look at the, yeah, I, I don't have the slides here. Hopefully it'll get on the podium with the SRS. But if you control what you can and you look carefully, at what you can control, alignment is critical, right? We can't control what the patient wanted, what their beliefs are, what they like expectations were. And that particularly affects prompts. You can't control, you know, how someone does a PCO or if someone does huge wide lammies, right? The huge wide lammies all the way, their pseudarthrosis rate is going to be higher irrespective of lumbar alignment, right? Just as an example. I think reconstruction of alignment should put us in a biomechanically favorable situation when we're up and walking, because that is when the muscles are working. The muscles aren't doing anything when you're sitting. These patients hate sitting down because when you sit down, your pelvis retroverts, your lumbar spine flattens. Once you're fused, you can't do that. So these patients need to sit with a big pillow. I think the converse of this is trying to figure out now where we should fix the muscular kids tend to do very well when you flatten them out and pull the curve over and try to swing their pelvis back underneath their, their spinal column, because all they do is sit down. And as long as you don't make them too flat with too much upper kyphosis, they tend not to PJK either because they're not doing any work. The target L1PA is half of the PI minus 20. Target lordosis is 60% of PI plus 30. And some people will say like, oh, these are big corrections. You shouldn't be doing big corrections on older patients. Um, I think that's completely false too. And I think that's part of, uh, you know, some of you are working with real minimally invasive masters. I think you need to take those skills and start doing good surgeries. And I think we can make substantial sagittal plane corrections with less invasive surgeries. Now, maybe they involve multiple incisions. I don't fear multiple incisions. What I fear is lots of tissue damage to release all of the mitochondrial DNA and, and damage associated molecular patterns into the bloodstream, all the bone marrow. That's what makes um, sort of the gross inflammatory response, not an incision. And I think it's important that we do what it takes and do it right the first time, whether it's a C2 to the sacrum or an L4, L5. And this is an example, right? This is from social media. This is, and this, the problem is, right? Perfect reduction. Who cares about sagittal translation? Perfect reduction within one degree of the plan. I would offer that the plan stinks. Now this port, and look where the hips are. So this is ultra high PI, right? They have no lordosis here. They're extending up here and it's gonna, it, this is not gonna work. This is gonna fail. And we've, this is not someone intentionally doing a bad job. This is us lacking the sort of knowledge uh, or wherewithal to actually go and do the right thing. All right, thanks. Yep, 31 minutes. Thanks, Any Mike, questions? that was awesome.
Any questions? So, Mike, uh, given the fact that a lot of people do spondy surgery, so let's take that as a good example. Um, are you targeting that 15 degrees that you typically see that four or five? And you're just going to fight to get that no matter what? Is that kind of what your thought is? Or Yep. Yep. So, gen like, gen if they have disc collapse and, and it's, even it's flat, right? If it's flat, that's relative kyphosis. And it's not one that's correcting into lordosis. I will go in the front. And again, that's, I think, where like some of you guys that are very facile with that, uh, with sort of minimally invasive oblique approaches or however you want to get there. Um, I don't know if direct lateral can get you 15 degrees a lot, um, but I think going in the front and then just fixing it with screws in the back is a very good way to do it. And I think doing five degree L4, L5 fusions is, is not good. Yeah. Happens a lot, doesn't it? It happens a ton. But, it happens a ton. Because everyone wants to, to do a T lift and do it in 45 minutes and they, they care whether the patient's awake or asleep, but the patient's not going to care if they were awake or asleep when it fails in two years. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Do you, uh, what are your thoughts on like patients that have like a four or five spondy that's clearly symptomatic, but then have like flat five one? Um, do you, I, so are you, a, are you a fan of doing a two level fusion then on all those or like yeah, you're I would say it, it depends, right? And some of that comes to the conversation you have with the patient. Um, I, what I would generally so just supposing like, and that's, you know, Dr. Chapman just wrote that every, every, we have to pay attention to this because every surgery where we fuse someone, we got to do the right thing. If they truly only have neurogenic claudication, I would in general, just treat the four or five segment but I would try to do four or five either through a lateral or an oblique approach where I don't burn an anterior at five one. But if what you're ever going to have to do is going to burn five one, I would just take it then and make it right. Yeah. But usually what we tried to do was avoid something that would burn a subsequent anterior at L5 S1. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that like, that's a good question. Cause I, I think some people listen to me and they're like, Oh, this guy wants to do T3 to sacrums on everybody. That's totally not what I'm saying. I think we need, like, I think regional alignment matters. I think this, the notion of like, oh, we're going to minimally invasive this and that, look what I did. We're fusing something that God or mother nature, whatever you believe made to move, right? We're putting metal in and we're gluing these bones together that are supposed to move. That's the most biologically like abnormal thing we could possibly do. We don't do it in any other region of orthopedic surgery unless it's an absolute salvage, right? Uh, and I think that's something that some of the neurosurgeons, like they kind of miss out on that. And I put it, it's in my grand round stock, but like if you fuse an elbow, if you fuse a shoulder, if you fuse a hip, right? Those are numbers that you get tortured with on your in-training exams and board exam. You got to know the position to fuse a shoulder in. And it's very rarely done. Thousands of spine fusions are done every day. And I would be willing to bet you a buck that very few surgeons even think about where they're fusing it. They're just going to get the case done because it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. And in the short run, it doesn't, right? And that's the other problem because people don't get follow-up. Right. So yeah. like in the first six months, yeah, you take, you take the degeneration away and you take the stenosis away. They're going to feel great. And that's the, that's the trick because we, we don't associate their poor outcome with our poor surgery, right? right? They're far enough removed that we don't take responsibility for. And you know, we also our, say like when they come back in two years, we say, oh, it's the natural history. It might yeah. not be. There is like some data to support the idea of restoring regional alignment to reduce adjacent segment degeneration rates. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. 